This video is brought to you by Passport, the Bitcoin hardware wallet you already know how to use. Stay tuned to the video to learn more. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. Today we have a very special guest, Peter St. Owens. This is his second time now on the show. And what a time to have a guest like him on the show to talk to us about the state of markets, the state of the Fed, um, and frankly, how Austrian economists are totally vindicated in the light of yet another crisis and the Fed's response to it. So, so Peter, welcome to the show, man. Thanks. It's great to be back, Joe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, let's, um, let's dive right into it. Uh, talk to us about where we're at in the economic cycle. Obviously, you know, the Fed went on this really aggressive tightening campaign 13 months ago. There's talk that policy takes 12 to 18 months of a lag to actually transmit to the real economy. And then within a few weeks, you know, banks went from fully solvent, no issues whatsoever to a string of bank failures, interbank lending freezing up. And inevitably, this is going to pass through to consumers, businesses and property developers in the form of fewer loans. So where are we right now in the economic cycle? Yeah, we're exactly there. Uh, that's a really good description of it. We're at the inflection point kind of between the inflation, and the recession. You know, our modern central banking system has a script they follow every time they follow it over and over, uh, which they call the business cycle. Uh, and that starts with the inflation in order to get these sort of tissue fire going, right? They want the economy to really take off. You know, they want there to be uh, sort of too many jobs and too much investment and too much competition for resources. And how do they do that? They make money super cheap. They, they essentially print it themselves. And, you know, Austrian economics has been warning about that for about 100 years now, where, you know, this this cycle inevitably leads to first you've got a quote unquote overheating economy, you got that tissue fire that burns real bright, but it, it goes out real fast. That then leads to inflation because you got all this money flooded in the economy. In order to try to stop the inflation, central banks inevitably raise rates or they, they cut off liquidity uh, in a number of ways. And then that leads to a recession. And it's quite frequent during the recessions that financial intermediaries go bust. Why? Because they were the conduits for all of that easy money. Uh, and then at that point, you know, everybody on Wall Street gets payday. So they make a ton of money during the inflation stage. Uh, during the recession stage, they then get bailed out. So it's like a gambler where you know they, they make money win or lose. Every time they lose, it's just we, the taxpayers, that have to foot the bill. Yeah, it seems cycle after cycle, this is, this is always the case. Uh, new and unique methods of uh, debasing the currency and, and creating new acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, now now everyone's sort of skirting around definitions and it's not QE, it's not a bailout. What what sort of precedent do, does, you know, the, the Fed's response set, I, I think, is the way that I'll phrase it. Like, you know, you, you call it tissue fire, and I think that's a phenomenal response. Yeah, I think it sets a very dangerous precedent. The pattern that we've been going through, especially since about about the 1970s or so, is that every cycle gets riskier than the last. Every cycle has more human shields at risk. Therefore, every you know cycle needs a bigger bailout. And you know, part of this acronym game they play, where they you know they've got a a new <laughs> a newly invented you know mechanism for each one. And of course, they're going to frame it like this is science. Uh, sorry, they're going to frame it like this is science. Uh, but what they're doing here is expanding the risk, right? They're they're creating, um, you know, more moral hazard. They're incentivizing all of these financial intermediaries to take yet more gambles. Uh, and so what we've seen this time around is, you know, with these FDIC uh, expansions, right, where the FDIC had already covered up to 250000 That was extraordinarily generous. The median American has about $5,000. Uh, in their bank account, so two fifty covered you know everybody but the the plutocrats right we 're not in widows and orphans territory anymore, and then at the just out of the blue, like it was you know like it was just a house cleaning operation, they then extended that to effectively infinite uh, and now there 's concerns that that infinite number right the fact that uh, you can park your money in an American bank and there's a good chance that all of it will be completely insured by taxpayers, that could draw trillions of dollars out of the European banks 
European banks are even more wobbly than American banks for a number of reasons. But the biggest is that you're, in Europe, banks are about twice uh, the, uh, the size relative to their economies that they are in the U.S. So, it, you know, it's sort of you cause one problem and then you sort of manipulate something else to try to fix that. That causes a bigger problem on and on and on, like a series of dominoes. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways, this is similar to what we saw in 2008. And we know how this ends. This ends with eye-watering bailouts. Bailouts is, is the word of the day, even though everyone seems to be avoiding it like the plague. They come up with a new acronym each time. But at the end of the day, is the net effect of what the Fed's doing right now the same as QE? Because the way that I view it, um, through base, it's an implicit bailout, right? They're preventing these institutions mm -hmm. from needing to sell their distressed U.S. Treasuries and MBS. Um, in order to shore up cash. They can just go to the Fed and borrow against it at par. But because they can borrow against distressed collateral at par, doesn't that have the same bank reserves out of nowhere effect as QE? And so it's distributing risk throughout the system and incentivizing this even further? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's a little bit like the socialism game, right? Where, you know, you say something like... Uh, uh, giving uh, free insurance to people, free medical insurance to socialism. And the other side says, no, 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 no. The definition of socialism is that, you, you know, they actually have to like run the grocery stores to be true socialism. And this is a game, right? And the game is, is to essentially um, neutralize uh, any criticism until we're 99.9% .9 of the way, at which point they say, well, look at you dreaming of the old days, crazy person. Uh, and it's similar here, right? Anything that raises liquidity, Okay, anything that is flooding fresh money into the system, uh, easy money is QE. That is the purpose of QE. The you know little mechanisms, whether you know, so with the uh, BTFP, they're talking about how you know this in theory will be paid back someday. No, no, this is all deck chairs on the Titanic. The question is, are they flooding in easy money? If they are, then what they're trying to do is a to uh, you know, to, to sort of respark a little bit of tissue so that the crash um, isn't so bad. B, they're causing something that is ultimately going to be, you know, going to uh, end in inflation. Uh, and then C, you know, again, they, at every single one of these steps, not only are you flooding liquidity into the system, uh, you are raising moral hazard across the board. If a bank can make a loan and believe that you know, any failed loan is going to be handled by the taxpayer. Why not just give all of your bank capital to the next homeless guy who walks in the door who you can credibly believe is going to pay you 10% for a year or two until you can, you know, hand it over to the taxpayer? You, you, you would have no lending standards. Given the political realities of today, I can guess who's going to get access to credit in that world. So it's, it's no longer bailout after bailout after bailout, whatever acronym it is, it's no longer loan creation on the basis of that person being credit worthy and being able to Bingo. generate a positive return on capital. It's just loan creation for the sake of loan creation. Right. And, you know, given the realities of our current system, it would probably be handed out demographically as opposed to who actually has a business plan that might work. Uh, I mean, you, it would look like the Soviet ghost plan uh, where, you know, the state decided who was going to get capital. Uh, you know, but rather than banks sitting there and trying to figure out who's got a good business plan, who's got a chance of actually building, uh, a, you know, a factory that will make something instead, it would be politically uh, allocated according to activists. This is uh, this is extremely fascinating. And uh, I want to I want to shift gears momentarily here into your <clears throat> most recent sub stack. Um, I found this particularly fascinating. Walk us through sort of in the light of this, uh, where we're at in the cycle and the fact that we are already entering the, the sort of bailout phase, um, talking about how, you know, sort of chaos is a ladder, right? And the Fed's rolling all of it. Where do we go from here? Yeah, so in the sub stack, um, I sort of laid out a metaphor that I've liked uh, for a while, which is, and, and it's also something that Safedean talks about, uh, which is that, you know, one of the biggest problems that central banks cause is that they are effectively venture capitalists to the crisis industrial complex, meaning that, you know, whether it's a new war, whether it's the Green New Deal, whether it's some, uh, whether it's a pandemic, uh, the initial costs of some massive new government program, they can be hidden by a central bank, right, because they can be deficit funded, and then the central bank can buy up all of that debt, and so it you know, it, it, it neutralizes the bond vigilantes who 
in other words, um, the investors who would otherwise uh, sort of act as a restraint on the ability of government to borrow unlimited amounts. So in this case, because you have a central bank, you can float uh, all of that and you can sort of inoculate the voters for years on end until those new government initiatives can metastasize, right? They can generate a entire army of activists, of bureaucrats, of special interests, of crony corporations. Uh, I think green energy is an absolute, you know, textbook case of this. Uh, I think World War I was a textbook case of that. Uh, you know, initially in the war, and, and again, this is something that uh, Saifedean talks about quite a bit, which is great. Early in World War I, there was sort of an assumption across Europe that this was just, uh, you know, this was going to be a, uh, a good jaunt. You know, this was going to be a little punch down. It was going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we would see who's more manly. And of course, it turned into what it did. Uh, you know, really, it was a two part war, starting with World War I, and then they kind of had unfinished business, and it went all the way into 1945. And it was, I mean, really, it was, it was one of the greatest tragedies since maybe the Mongol invasions. Uh, and all of that, it, it, it was floated. Uh, it had a venture capitalist. It had central banks. It, you know, the war was started months after the Fed was stood up and it provided the bridge financing. And, you know, Safety has gone into a lot of detail about specifically what the Bank of England did to uh, sort of neutralize the costs of the war to the British people. If they had not done that, it's quite likely that Britain at some point would have said, hey, guys, this war is stupid. Let's cut this out. So I think that, you know, a lot of focus, sort of traditional focus on the Fed looks at what it does to the business cycle, which is absolutely horrific. Uh, every business cycle is caused by government intervention. The, the market on its own does not cause business cycles. It's absurd. Why would it? Uh, what causes, you know, business failures is entrepreneurs who make poor choices. Why would they all cluster all at once? It doesn't make any sense. Why would they all get stupid at once? And the reason is, of course, because governments intervene with the money supply uh, and they do it in a way that, you know, credit gets easy, credit gets tight, easy, tight. That has such a monumental impact. Uh, that's sort of the price on which the entire rest of the economy depends that by manipulating that, and they're quite open how they manipulate it. We can see it right in a chart, right? We can see the Fed yanks up interest rates and then the economy hits a recession. So your hypothesis either has to be that every time the Fed increases rates, a lot of business people get really stupid all of a sudden, or <laughs> maybe the Fed had something to do with it. Absolutely. Maybe the Fed did have something to do with it. That's part of my own personal thesis as well. I wrote a piece in um, the latest Bitcoin magazine about how uh, sort of the business cycle, right, this boom and bust is created by excessive easing, followed by excessive tightening, followed by excessive easing. And now we're entering, uh, I wrote a Substack piece that dropped this morning, and it was sort of the business cycle. Uh, slow and steady gains to productivity, but then the business cycle going expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. And we're really right at that inflection point heading into contraction. Um, why, why on earth, if this is created, if this is caused by the prevailing monetary authority, what's the utility of them? It, it, because we already have a fully functioning, deeply liquid set of interest rates in the US Treasury market. Granted, uh, it's still created by a central issuer, right? There's still the, the possibility for manipulation, but much less so. It's a set of interest rates that is set by the free market and it functions perfectly fine. What on earth is the utility of the Fed apart from creating these huge boom and bust cycles? Right. You know, uh, talking about the liquidity, this is actually cited often by proponents of a central bank or proponents of national debt. They say, no, 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 we need to have a national debt because we need these liquid so-called risk-free assets, uh, uh, you know, as sort of a ballast for the financial system. Uh, which is kind of a sick argument. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, if I steal, you know, your car and then, uh, you know, you have to come and beg my permission to use it. And I say, well, you know, you really need me, man, because I got the car. So in other words, in the absence of that kind of pool of government debt, uh, clearly, you know, what would happen is that there would be instruments that would pool corporate debt Okay, so you'd have, you know, 500 companies of some similar credit rating, and then you, it would, you know, maybe resemble an ETF, it'd be some sort of pooled asset. And that pooled asset together, uh, it, it is quite likely it would be actually less risky than government debt. The reason is that you don't have policy risk on it. Uh, but of course, that's not done. And a big reason it's not done is because governments treat their own debt and corporate debt differently. Right. So they pretend that it is beyond human ability to possibly have some pooled instrument of corporate debt. 
And instead, <laughs> you know, they, they just focus on the individual company. And then they say, well, clearly if I, you know, if, if I only focus on this, you know, sort of crippled version of my own debt, uh, then obviously I'm a better choice. And then they go on to, you know, whether it's Basel rules or they have very various uh, capital requirements where they, they privilege their own type of debt. So I think that argument is, is goofy. Um, it's self-interested. It's, it's, it's actually insulting. It's, it's stealing the car and then going on about, you know, you really owe me, man. I'm letting you uh, use your car. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, you know, if we look at the most recent crisis here, the Fed, you know, what is their purpose in life? Um, I think they're very, very good at what they do, which is to siphon money uh, onto Wall Street in good times and bad, which is pretty impressive. I think traditionally they've they've stuck to the good times thing, um, but, you know, they made out like bandits in 2008. I think people have to understand 2008 really, really worked out for Wall Street. They would be absolutely irresponsible if they didn't try to do that again. You know, their purpose is to serve uh, shareholders and anything legal as long as it serves shareholders. And this is a good way to run the world. Uh, the problem is that, you know, you have these sort of interactions between business and government where business, you, you know, can effectively uh, force the government to do things for it. At that point, I think it becomes very nefarious. But certainly, if if you're you know a large bank on Wall Street and you're not playing along in this game, you are you are not serving your shareholders, right? You should be going maximum risk, making money hand over fist, because of course in financial markets, risk and return correlates. You make more money if you take more risk, uh, and then you know just make sure you got all your lobbyists on uh, auto dial when the hard time comes. Make sure that you get paid twice on that. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, Foundation Devices. Passport is the Bitcoin hardware wallet that you already know how to use. With a gorgeous design and familiar interface, Passport makes it easier than ever to self-custody your Bitcoin. Take a look. This is an absolutely beautiful device. No more sitting at your computer or squinting at tiny screens. Passport, this small device that fits in the palm of your hand right here, it seamlessly connects to your phone and empowers you to quickly view your balances and move Bitcoin into and out of cold storage. And today we're offering a special deal. You can use the code BitcoinLayer for $10 off your own Passport when you receive uh, checkout or you can go to the link in our description to learn more. Now, back to the video. I want to ask you a question, and it's in regards to Custodia Bank. I'm sure you've uh, you, you've heard uh, yet again, you know, and and of course now they're uh, sort of in in legal battles surrounding this. They've been denied their banking license, and this the story of Custodia Banks sort of echoes what occurred with uh, the Lean Bank in that uh, they're trying to be a fully reserved institution, and right now we live in a fractionally reserved financial system whereby banks only hold a fraction of consumer deposits and they extend. Uh, credit on those deposits. Um, why? Why on earth do are these banks denied lending licenses? Yeah, yeah, that was the narrow bank, and right, they've denied these. Uh, which you know, the sort of party line on fractional reserve is that you need fractional reserve in order for capitalism to work. Uh, there were actually a bunch of uh, you know sort of uh, simps going on about how you know we owe everything to fractional reserve. The, the reason we have civilization uh, is fractional reserve, and so it would be embarrassing for that narrative if a bunch of full reserve banks showed up and capitalism kept on marching. And you know that's what both Custodia and Narrow Bank were trying to do is to actually have what we think of as traditional banking. So you take in deposits, you make loans, uh, but that was fully backed. Uh, and, you know, I think what a lot of people don't understand about full reserve, there is sort of this industry that attacks it uh, in a way that's similar to the gold standard or to Bitcoin, for that matter. Uh, and the claim is that it's untenable because they attack a straw man that is not what full reserve is. Uh, so what full reserve actually is, is that you would essentially uh, allow depositors to put their money into two different types of accounts. One account would be a demand uh, account, which would be immediately available to them. So they could show up in five minutes and take out all of their money if they want. And then the other type of account would be a time deposit. The time deposit, many people will know that as a uh, CD, a uh, certificate of deposit. And a time deposit might be on one month, three month, one year, whatever. So a time deposit is effectively a short-term loan to the bank. A demand deposit, Right, because it's instantly available to you, it should also 
be backed by instant cash, right? Any business that owes something immediate and does not have cash for it, we have a word for that. It is bankruptcy. So, you know, if you're a restaurant and you, you know, I, I don't know, you've got an employee who quit and you owe him his last paycheck and you say, hey, come pick it up anytime. Well, you, you, you've actually got to have the cash if he comes and picks it up anytime. Uh, and, you know, of course, in the case of Fracture Reserve, what they do is they, they just say all of it is demand deposit. All of it you can have at any time. So in other words, the dollars are sitting there waiting for you, grandma. But meanwhile, they go and lend the dollars out. So they are pretending, they are claiming, I would argue fraudulently, they are claiming that a dollar is in two places at once. And because they are claiming that, grandma thinks her money is there. She, she is under the impression her money is actually sitting somewhere in a vault uh, waiting for her. And then if she goes and tries to get the money, unlike Walmart, where you try and go get eggs, and if they don't have any eggs, you know, oh, shoot, okay, I'll have to come back tomorrow. People don't do that with banks, right? If the bank is out of money, people do not go, ah, no problem, I'll come back tomorrow when you have more money. They will have new money tomorrow. Money comes and goes, it flows around the system, but people don't react that way. People freak out. Why? Because they did not know their money <laughs> wasn't there, right? So if people don't understand a contract, then under, under ANCAP, under Libertarian, under you name it, that is an invalid contract. If the other side knows they don't understand it and continues pitching the contract to them, like if you run around the old folk, you know, people with dementia and try to sell them, you know, structured finance products. Okay. If you persist in that, that is considered fraud. Every legal system considers that fraud. So if we can see from their behavior, the fact that regular depositors engage in bank runs, they don't do that at Walmart. Uh, you know, there've been many surveys that ask people, do you think your money is sitting in the bank? And 74% uh, believe that it's sitting there. So in light of this, people do not understand fractional reserve. Therefore, any bank that perseveres knowing this is committing fraud. So an easy solution is that you use a mechanism that already exists uh, called uh, suitability test. So those are used, for example, with more complex financial products. Any investor who wants to start trading stock options or futures, your broker will assess your ability. They will give you sort of a test. They want to make sure that you know what you're doing. Why? Because if you wipe out, they want to make sure that they're covered. So the financial system, or I'm sorry, so the legal, so the judge does not conclude that they were engaging in fraud. And so similarly, fractional reserve, because so few people understand it, it should be subject to a, to a suitability test. If you are a financial advisor, if you are Warren Buffett, then of course you can fractional reserve because you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. If you are a grandma parking you know, her money uh, that would otherwise be in the coffee can, then it should be presumed to be fraud. And, and there should be some reason why the bank believes that she knows what she's doing. Perhaps she brought in her broker's son who vouched or who will be managing money. Uh, there needs to be a positive responsibility on the bank to determine whether the person is actually competent uh, to engage in fractional reserve. So in a fractional reserve system, going by the current world, about 20% of deposits today are in checking accounts. Set par, I, I would expect that to continue. So you'd have about 20% where that would be in a demand deposit. It'd be fully backed by cash. That would be maybe a, a, a couple months uh, cash usage, something like that. That you would probably have to pay custodial fees and then the other 80% of bank deposits, you know, everything beyond a, a, a small amount uh, that you use day to day, that would be in some sort of a savings account with a time deposit on it, at which point the bank can just operate like any other company, right? The vast majority of Ford Motor Company's assets are in, uh, or I'm sorry, of their liabilities are in bonds. Those don't have to be backed. Ford is not permanently bankrupt. <laughs> Ford doesn't, you know, uh, there aren't runs against Ford. Why? Because it has an actual uh, time structure on it. So all of the, you know, in a full reserve system, most of the debt, most of the liabilities uh, or deposits of the bank would be in time deposits. They would not need to be backed at all. The system would not be inherently uh, unstable at all. And note, 80% of all the money would still be lent out. Right? You would only have 20% in the vault because that's the money that is instantly available to depositors. Uh, and then of course, you know, if we go backwards a step, because here I'm sort of getting to that claim that you know, if you have full reserve banking, you, you wouldn't have any uh, startups, you wouldn't have you know, any capitalism. Even that final 20%, okay, that because it's, uh, it, 
it's effectively buried. It, it's like temporarily out of the money supply. Uh, that buying power transfers over to the money that actually is in circulation. And, you know, you can see that theoretically, but if you sort of, um, you know, on an, an intuitive level, in the, say, startup market, that final 20% that's sitting there in the vault actually waiting for grandma, that is not competing for resources, okay? It is not competing for workers or for factories or for steel to build warehouses. All right, if it's not competing for it, that means that the remaining 80% of dollars can get more steel, okay? In other words, and, and so in economics terms, the 20% that's out of circulation has effectively transferred it's buying power to the 80%. So at the end of the day, you lose absolutely nothing. You still keep 80% of your loan capital out there. The 80% of loan capital buys more, probably quite close to 100%. Uh, and you don't have bank runs. You don't have this institutionalized fraud. You don't have a financial system that is teetering on the edge of disaster uh, permanently. Thank you for busting that myth about fractional reserve banking being <laughs> the engine for growth. We know that Keynesians love to associate credit expansion with economic growth. And unfortunately, uh, you know, that's that's what has created the boom and bust cycle. Just credit expansion to people who don't deserve it, just people who take out loans yep. because rates are so low. And then when those rates are, are extremely elevated, they get caught with their pants down, a wave of defaults ensues, and then the cycle begins Bingo. anew. Um, so, so Thank, thank you for, for sort of uh, uh, busting that myth and, and highlighting how even in a fully reserved system, um, you know, we, we would still see startups, we would still see businesses taking on loans, right? It wouldn't yep. destroy credit. Yeah. It would just increase the quality of credit and therefore, and obviously the, the amount of uh, money held at the bank and therefore reduce the overall fragility of the financial system. Bingo. Absolutely. Phenomenal. I want to get your thoughts on these OPEC cuts. I know you did a video on this a few days ago. I've done a little bit of digging on my own. Um, the, uh, obviously, many are touting this as wildly inflationary. Some people are touting it as the exact opposite, and this is a demand response function. Um, I te tend to lean towards the latter uh, for, for the reason that we saw uh, uh, last year, uh, OPEC cuts supply by, I believe, 500,000 barrels um, or a million barrels, yep. you could be wrong, in October, and the price went down. Uh, the price has continued to channel right. down. And um, uh, I want to get your thoughts on on uh, why, why this is occurring, what the price response will be, and then the effect uh, on the dollar as a result of all of this. Right. I think the cuts themselves are, um, they're not that substantial. It's something that you would normally expect at this stage in the cycle. The world economy is slowing. When the economy slows, oil demand goes down. That means that, you know, OPEC historically has always cut supply uh, whenever they expect oil demand to go down. So I think that's just pretty much uh, what you expect. I think that the reason why this is such a big deal and the reason why it's being talked about so much is that it was such a slap in the face of the United States, especially coming essentially immediately after uh, China had brokered this, uh, basically settled the, I don't know, 40-year war going on or Cold War going on between Saudi and Iran, uh, paired with... I don't know if they formally applied, but they've been making a lot of uh, movements, you know, towards joining the various organs of this BRICS or of the of the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, I think it's called uh, the Shanghai Group. And the Shanghai Group is, you know, China's sort of answer to U.S. hegemony. And so for for so quickly to have this sequence of Saudi and Iran making peace, joining that group and then immediately just going, I mean, straight punch to the nose of the United States. I think that that is what's really interesting here. And that starts to raise questions whether the petrodollar is going away, right? Whether the 50, 50 year, whether the 50 year sort of gentleman's agreement between the US and Saudi, where the US handles security as an unpaid mercenary, uh, specifically protecting them against Iran, uh, and then in return, they use the dollar, you know, which then sort of acts as a linchpin for a lot of world trade, uh, that that deal is no longer needed for the Saudis. And indeed, the most valuable thing that American protection was giving them was their conflict with Iran, right? Iran had a proxy war going on in Yemen. Uh, it's, uh, they've had proxy wars in Syria. Iran's really been a big problem for them. And so if... Now, all of a sudden, they don't need the security end of it, then, yeah, they might ask themselves, do we want the rest of it? Uh, 
And I think the background here is that there have been a ton of countries, not just Saudi, that have been questioning whether the dollar is worth it. And, you know, part of that is that the dollar is not what it used to be in terms of monetary policy. It's a cleaner, dirty shirt than the euro. It's a dirtier, dirty shirt than the yen. Um, it's, it's kind of a middling, you know, currency. Uh, in the 1970s, of course, it was, it was still a strong currency. It was still running on fumes from uh, the gold backing. Uh, so the dollar isn't what it used to be in terms of monetary policy. And then meanwhile, the dollar has picked up this, I think, pretty serious flaw in what happened in the uh, Ukraine conflict, right, where the U.S. actually seized the Russia central bank's dollars. And those were their sovereign dollars. They did not belong to the United States. They were merely denominated in dollars, which means that we had a way to grab them. And this set, I think, a absolutely catastrophic uh, precedent now. You're seeing uh, in Indonesia, you know, uh, the president there was talking about uh, diversifying away from the dollar. And he specifically said, look at what happened in Russia. All right. That is extremely scary for countries all over the world because the U.S. has become extremely unpredictable. Uh, you know, you you don't really know what the rules are anymore. And the specific reason that the U.S. took the Russian central bank's dollars was that they were hoping to set off a bank run, a bank panic, an entire societal collapse in Russia. It didn't work there. But if you're somebody like Egypt or Indonesia, if the U.S. comes in and seizes the assets, <laughs> the core assets of your central bank, there's a good chance that's going to work. So at that point, they feel like there's a gun to their head. And given the activist influence on, on, on U.S. policy, uh, it, you know, it, it might not be a bright line of invading your neighbor. It might, might be a bright line of having uh, the wrong union policy or the wrong LGBT policy or the wrong energy policy where the activists in you know, the U.S. Uh, effectively turn the U.S. government against you. And at that point, if they have the ability to literally crash your economy and your banks, you become their slave. So in that, you know, just looking at that cost benefit for a lot of countries, for starters, they might be interested in diversifying out of the dollar into the euro or the yen or something that doesn't have that kind of political baggage. And then meanwhile, of course, uh, China is run by much smarter people than the U.S. is at the moment. And so they see an opportunity. So they would like to come in and sweeten the pot and say, well, as long as you're getting away from the dollar, you should clearly divers uh, diversify over to the yuan. And so, you know, the dollar today has extremely strong network effects, of course. Uh, it's not going to be changing overnight, but I think that the seizing the Russian central bank's asset, I think was really, that's going to go down as history as really one of the biggest own goals possible because the risk now is that the U S shifts from an overwhelm the, the world shifts from an overwhelming dollar based system to one where it's diversified across multiple countries that absolutely do not include the U S Right. So it's diversified between Europe, Japan, Swiss franc, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, sort of a little bit of everybody, because collectively all of these uh, currencies you know, approach the U.S. in liquidity. So it's everybody gets, <laughs> you know, everybody gets a little bit but the U.S. Why? Because the U.S. is the only country that has that kind of risk built in that it can literally crash your uh, financial system. Gotcha. So there's this inherent risk built in with the dollar. The precedent was set after um, the United States uh, uh, seized Russia's dollar-denominated foreign exchange reserves, uh, froze those. And this is much more dangerous for those smaller countries who, if their reserves are seized, they're much more susceptible to total economic devastation. My question would be, what does this de-dollarization look like over the next uh, several decades? I think that's probably... If if this does unfold, I think that's probably the, the time frame that we're looking at, um, you know, because as of right now, over the last decade and since 2014, and I tweeted this chart out a few times, you may have seen it, the currency composition of foreign exchange reserves is still largely dollar denominated. Um, it's still right around 50%. Um, it's risen from around 40% um, since 2014. There was this de-dollarization going on from uh, 90, uh, the 1990s to 2014, and then that reverse course in 2014. Perhaps we're at another inflection point where those begin uh, decreasing uh, following uh, th this what, what Russia has done and more people are wanting to get out of Dodge. But um, given that this, this may take place over many, many decades, 
Um, what does that process look like, especially given uh, for many countries, the US dollar performs its function as it's supposed to be, right? It's a, it's a medium of exchange, even though you know uh, it is debasing relative to asset prices, it's doing its job per se. And I personally, uh, and, and I'll uh, get your thoughts on this, I don't envision uh, a collective of many, several currencies being used to lubricate global trade, um, being more viable for many nations to choose uh, over just using the US dollar. Right. I think, you know, many times they've tried to do sort of baskets of currencies and those never, ever work. Uh, I think the more likely is that you get kind of a patchwork where individual countries are using each other's currencies. I think that given modern, uh, you know, financial um, or payment systems, rather, I think that that has much lower transaction costs uh, than it did in the past. Uh, but I think sort of it, it's an interesting question. What's the long game here for the dollar? And it does have strong network effects. I, I, I'd be very surprised to see major change in dollar usage over the next couple of years. I think the bigger concern is that once you break a network effect, uh, you can't get that back. Uh, you know, if you look at the manufacturing industry in the U.S., for example, in the 1950s and 60s, the U.S. was absolutely dominant in manufacturing everything. Look back to a list of things that were invented in the world in that period. Everything was America. You would think that the rest of the world was asleep. Massive network effects. Okay, the talent was in America. The 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 companies, the you know supplier networks, everything was in America. And it took them about twenty years, but they did lose it. And at this point, you get political entrepreneurs in the U.S. who say, "No, no, no, we're going to bring manufacturing back." And boy, it's tough to crack. There was Akron, Ohio was the birth of curved glass, okay, where you can do like a glass wall that's actually curved. And that was invented in, I don't know, 1915 or whatever. And back then, Akron was <laughs> high tech. And so Akron wanted to build a museum to celebrate its history in glass. And so they wanted to get a uh, you know big piece of curved glass. And apparently, nobody in America can make it. Okay, it's like it's like America has regressed to the Stone Age. You know, they've they have forgotten tools. You know, it's like in the, uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire when <laughs> you know everybody goes yeah. backwards. Our biggest export now is uh, U.S. dollars. Yeah, bingo, bingo, exactly. Uh, so you know, Akron had to go and buy it in China, and you can be darn sure Akron didn't want to do that. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm certain all those guys uh, hated doing that, but there was no other way to do it. And by the way, China. Not Germany, because I'm sure Germany would have played better on the PR locally, okay? No, they could only go to China. Why? Because at this point, China has the um, network effect. Okay, so network effects cut both ways. And in the U.S., for a long time, they relied on the network effect. And they said, no, 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 that'll never happen. Ha ha. Uh, you know, if you look at the history in the 1980s, for example, how the U.S. treated new inventions, things like uh, VHS, they essentially gave it away to, to, to foreigners. It was, it was absolutely incredible. Um, and, and on purpose, you know, they would, they would prevent us companies from using it, uh, because of competitive concerns. And instead they would say, well, you have to license it to a bunch of Japanese companies. So we have more comp just absolutely. And that's what you do. If you're complacent, if you think that, you know, by gum, we're America, there's no way these foreigners can ever make anything, but, you know, a little chintzy junk, uh, let them make the junk and guess what, uh, you know, a a little tiger grows up to be something scary. So I think that's the concern. Um, you know, yes, it's been eroding. You know, if we look at over the past 20 years, I think on net, it's gone down about 10%. It's gone down from about 70 points to about just below 60 points. Uh, it fluctuates. You mentioned 2014. In times of panic, generally people fly to whatever is the most liquid asset. So, you know, whenever uh, if we look at 2008, for example, there was a period of very strong, uh, dollar. And in a sense, that was ironic because, you know, because the source of the crisis was coming from America. So why does everybody like America? He caused the problem. Uh, but this is kind of standard. Uh, it does, by the way, raise a, I think, interesting long-term question. Well, here, just, just to finish that thought. Um, so, well, okay. So I think the sort of long-term question here is over a decade's time frame. What if the death here is not just the dollar? What if the death here is actually fiat? Like, what if fiat is doomed, right? What if this system of inflation, recession, bailout is doomed? And there I think you actually get this sort of paradoxical uh, effect where 
in seriously bad times, you know, if the sort of market, right, the market here, meaning uh, individual humans, right, what they decide to own as money uh, or to store their wealth, if the market loses faith in fiat, then paradoxically, I think it'll actually be quite good for the U.S. dollar. Uh, I think the line I like is uh, the road to fiat death is lined with the corpses of other currencies that the U.S. dollar feeds on along the way. Um, because generally the weakest will go first, right? It'll be, you know, Brazil or, or uh, uh, Mozambique or something that'll go first. And then all of that demand, some of that demand will be completely obliterated, of course. In other words, the people who used to own Mozambique currency uh, will now have no money. Uh, some of it that can escape will then switch over to some stronger. If we take Mozambique, then a certain amount of it would go to dollars, euros, yen, South Africa, okay, because, you know, of local knowledge. Uh, and then, of course, if if fiat is really on its last legs, then, you know, next level up would be somebody like South Africa. So a bunch of it dies and then a bunch of it goes to whatever euro dollars, et cetera. And sort of the last man standing in that, given today's dynamics, at least set, setting aside the political risks, you know, sort of on the market dynamics, right, the liquidity, uh, the sort of installed base uh, on that metric in that sort of long line of fiat death, you would expect each death would paradoxically uh, build demand for the dollar. It could actually make the dollar strong. Uh, and then, of course, finally, you know, you've got sort of the last man standing, sort of teetering. Uh, like, imagine this, this uh, I don't know, like a small rowboat that's now got 25,000 people all trying to hold on to the thing floating for, for dear life. Uh, and now the last thing goes down. So I think that is actually possible if we're looking at the end of fiat uh, as opposed to the end of the U.S. dollar along the way. That is a fascinating perspective, and I, I believe uh, I fully agree with that notion. In times of strife, in times of crisis, you're seeing it now. People are buying treasuries. What was the worst performing? What had this worst year last year? Now everyone and their mother wants some, right? Everyone's buying it. And so even as yeah. these individual fiats crumble, the dollar you know, probably stands to, to do quite well and sort of absorb that lost liquidity. Uh, I think through time, um, you know, Bitcoin and the dollar will coexist. Um, I have two more questions. And this one, I, I'm really interested in your answer. What is Bitcoin's role in all of this, right? If the dollar is to continue along this path um, as fiat dies, absorbing this liquidity over the next many, many decades, which is generally my base case, um, what, what's Bitcoin's role in all of this, right? What, how much of that liquidity does it stand to absorb? Uh, what, it, what does it look like over the next several decades? Yeah, I see Bitcoin as really complementary to gold. I think economically it is, it does almost everything gold does. Uh, it generally does it more. <laughs> it goes up more, it goes down more. It is <laughs> pretty much across the board. It's a super gold. Uh, and I, I mean, clearly that's by design. Uh, Satoshi was inspired by gold. He wanted to create something that resembled gold. And I, it, it's astounding uh, that he did that. But so I think that when we're talking about the role of Bitcoin in what's coming next, I think that it is similar to what we would say about gold, where uh, both act as a lifeboat. Uh, some people will escape. It's also a way to sort of keep score, right? So, you know, as you're measuring the dollar in gold or in Bitcoin, uh, it's a way for people to understand what exactly is happening to them. It also, thankfully, right, number goes up, lures people onto the lifeboat. So I'm a huge supporter of numbers go up, uh, Bitcoin increasing in price, even if I didn't own any, a huge supporter because, you know, pr my guess is most Bitcoiners came for the profits. And as they owned it, as it went up, you know, generally any stock that goes up, it's more likely the person is going to actually look into the company, and, you know, uh, out of appreciation, if nothing else. Uh, so I do think that a lot of people have have come onto the lifeboat uh, because of the price. And, you know, I think that's also going to be happening with gold. Gold has been having a heck of a year uh, for many of the same reasons Bitcoin has. And I think that, you know, as that process continues, the... A big factor, I think, when people are choosing between Bitcoin and gold uh, is, frankly, age, right? So I, I personally, I think that Bitcoin is better than gold for a number of reasons. Um, maybe the most dramatic would be sovereign immunity. So the government cannot seize it. The government has and will, will again seize gold. They do it recreationally. They do it all the time. Uh, and then the other thing that I think really beats gold 
on Bitcoin is just that you can send it over distance. Uh, you can do this at near zero cost. In fact, you can do this cheaper than credit cards or debit cards. That's really where that sovereign immunity comes from in the first place. But what it means is that, you know, hand to hand gold, like buying stuff by handing people gold coins, you know, if you tally up how much money you spend in a month, okay, and what percent of those transactions were hand to hand, like you handed over a paper dollar, uh, probably roughly zero, right? Depending on your age, approximately zero. And so the problem there, of course, is that in the 17th century, gold worked because almost all transactions, or anyway, a large share of transactions for many people were hand to hand. Today, uh, gold would simply not work, not on its own. It would need some kind of intermediary. So something like a gold backed credit card, which I love, but guarantee you that'll be controlled by the government. It is impossible. You can't hide where the credit card is located or where the gold is located. If you did, then, of course, it'd be quite likely that you would run off with it. Um, so gold simply doesn't work in a modern economy. Bitcoin solves both of these problems beautifully. I think the main barrier, I mentioned age a moment ago, uh, that that's really what's standing in the way here. And, you know, as people age, um, we get people who are 78 and you know, God bless them, but uh, they're not going to understand Bitcoin. It's, it's it's just how it works. Uh, every so often you get somebody who's intellectually brave and dives right in, uh, but it's rare. So, you know, those people love gold and I don't have anything against gold. That's fine. Uh, but as time goes on, uh, they get replaced by younger people. And a lot of younger people, you know, if you look at people in their 20s, for example, who are skeptical of fiat, I think the overwhelming majority do go with Bitcoin. And so over time, the, the, the sort of hard money uh, demand will shift, if only by age, it'll shift from gold, where I think it overwhelmingly is today, based on market capitalizations, and then it'll shift over to Bitcoin. So that kind of raises the question, you know, when we ask if fiat dies, what replaces it? Therefore, I think that that has everything to do with when is it happening? Okay, so if fiat is dying in the next five or 10 years, where I think it's extraordinarily unlikely, I'd be thrilled, but <laughs> I wouldn't bet on it, then gold would be the successor, right? Because almost nobody understands Bitcoin. Yes, we proselytize. We, we put everything we have into it, but it's going to take time. Uh, on the other hand, if the death of fiat is, this is something we're talking about in 40 or 50 years, then I would say, we're just going to skip gold. There's no point. Gold is a handicapped Bitcoin I was talking with Stefan Levera about this um, the other day, sort of, you know, in terms of um, orange pilling people, where when you boil out the, um, you know, sort of technical details, I think both Bitcoin and gold, they work the way that people, normal people, normies actually think that money works. Okay, so grandma thinks that money is like a coin. It's sitting in the vault. She goes to get the coin. If she uses the credit card, then somebody goes there, you know, like the Maytag man with a little cap and he goes in and he picks up the coins and he takes them somewhere else. What's happening in her mind, okay, that this is a bearer asset. The bank is holding on to, you, to it for you, okay? But she, she doesn't understand the rest of it. This, this horrific, like horror show that makes up the fiat system. No, in her mind, money is Bitcoin. Okay, it is a bearer asset. You own it. It's your coin. There you go. If you want somebody to store it, like, I mean, why would you? But anyway, uh, maybe grandma's worried about dementia, so she wants to have a custodian. Okay, it's possible. At any rate, you could have somebody uh, custody it for you, but it's still a coin. You know, they're not fractional reserve. You know, they're not building this whole uh, infrastructure off of it. No, it's just a coin. So I think that, you know, over time, I think a lot more people are going to understand that. They're going to understand that, you know, f Bitcoin is not the difficult to understand one. That's not the complex one. What's complex is the fiat. I mean, the fiat is intentionally difficult to understand. And remember earlier, we were talking about contracts, that any contract that is intentionally difficult to understand is fraud. So fiat, it's complex, very hard to understand. It is not at all what people think money is. What is very intuitive and is exactly what you think money is, is Bitcoin. Extremely well said. Bitcoin works the way you think money works. That is tremendous. And um, you know, over the next uh, many, many uh, small cycles and, and many uh, larger cycles, we're going to continue seeing 
these perpetual bailouts, uh, this perpetual debasement, yep. um, and of course, uh, the monetization of things like Bitcoin. And for Bitcoin to, to be the hard money of choice, uh, you know, it, many decades from now, uh, it'll have to surpass the liquidity profile of things like gold and eventually U.S. treasuries as well in order to, uh, to really get there. Um, I, I want to leave off on one thing, uh, one question to ask you to quote your sub stack. You said, even if we do come out of this in one piece, the crisis will keep going as long as central banks exist. So if we come out of this in one piece, what does the future hold? Does the amplitude of cycles keep widening? Um, and uh, in this particular cycle we're in, uh, when does the train come off the tracks if it, if it isn't already off the tracks? Yeah, I think the cycles will continue until the frog realizes the water is boiling. And you can do that two ways. One of them is that is what what you and I do, which is to try to educate people and to make them understand what's actually happening. Uh, before the water is boiling, you say, have you noticed the water is getting warm? Uh, and then, of course, the other way to do it is just to wait and see and wait until the water does boil. And that gives you a French Revolution or a Russian Revolution or an outcome that I think none of us want, where many innocents die. Uh, so I hope that this thing will not unravel, but uh, it will not unravel in that way, that we can actually fix it in time. But I think that we have to be realistic that the frog will not wake up until there is some pain. Uh, so, you know, if we take in the US case, for example, the 1970s, the economy was quite bad. We had very high inflation. We also had high unemployment. We had a recession. Stagflation was the new word they coined. And in a sense, it took the pain from that in order to get a Ronald Reagan, who he wasn't perfect, but economically he did turn a lot of things around. Uh, he gave a sense to people that America was back, that America was not on this sort of fatal road to oblivion. And the point being that there's a certain amount of pain that it would be nice if people paid enough attention in good times that they would actually sort of do the housekeeping, you know, like they would maintain the roof when it's sunny out as opposed to waiting for the hurricane. Uh, but at any rate, it does take a pretty serious storm to get people to fix the roof. You hope that it's not going to be so bad that the entire roof comes off. But I think that that's you know really what we have to target here. And so I think all of us during this period of crisis here, uh, it looks in many ways like the 1970s. And I think that's certainly what I'm trying to do is to, is, is to make people aware that this is not just a random event. OK, that this is built in. Uh, if you don't stop this, this is this is forever. And if we look at the past couple of cycles anyway, the amplitude is getting worse, uh, specifically because every crisis that comes, banks, above all, they rewrite the rule book so that they can make it worse next time, so that they can get more and more hazard, they can get uh, more risk that they can then get bailed out for. So, right. I think that's, that, that's sort of the fate here uh, if we don't stop it before then. Phenomenal. Well, you're certainly helping to spread that information and ideally try to get the frogs to hop out of the boiling water before it turns into uh, an event that none of us want to see. As always, Peter, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a, a tremendous discussion. Um, your work uh, on Twitter and on Substack is unparalleled. You are receiving the exact kind of, uh, of accolades and appreciation that you deserve and that your work warrants. Uh, before we uh, sign off here, where can people find you? I'm really active on Twitter at P-R-O-F-S-T-O-N-G-E. Uh, also on, if you go there, you can find links to my Substack. I do a weekly column over there. And then all of the videos are gathered on YouTube. Fantastic. Thanks again, Peter. Uh, we'll do it again soon. Take care, everyone. And again, a special thanks to Passport for sponsoring this video. Foundation Devices is a fantastic company and they make, make an extremely beautiful device, as you can see here. It is an absolutely remarkable piece of work. It is the best in class design for a Bitcoin hardware wallet. And if you have been on the fence about taking your Bitcoin into self custody, now's the time. Not only are you getting a sweet deal, but this is the best device on the market for ease of use and easily putting your Bitcoin into cold storage if you've been on the fence. You can use code Bitcoin Layer at checkout. You can go to the bitcoinlayer.com slash foundation or use the link in our description. Take care, guys.